we're lucky to have Yuri here today. Uh, he is at the beginning of what we predict will be a long and brilliant career, uh, teaching computer science at Stanford. Um, prior to uh, coming to Stanford, he uh, was working as a postdoc at Cornell, uh, where he did work on a really interesting tool called Meme Tracker, which is uh, a large part of what we're going to talk about today. Uh, but his work, along with his uh, colleagues uh, John Kleinberg and Dan uh, Hudenlocker, uh, is some of the most interesting work being done right now on sort of the frontier of quantitative analysis of media, which is to say now that a great deal of uh, journalistic and other media is available online, what can we do with statistical tools to analyze how the news cycle uh, takes place? Prior to that, uh, he did his work at Carnegie Mellon, uh, and also at the University of uh, Ljubljana in his uh, native Slovenia. So we are uh, thrilled to have Yuri with us, and he's going to give us a talk which will start general and probably get technical until some of us wave our arms and uh, tell him to stop getting technical, and then we'll have an open conversation about it. Okay, so, welcome. So, um, thanks a lot. Um, so the plan for uh, today are sort of three things. Um, first, I want to show you so the motivating question for everything will be, OK, what can you do if you can go on the web and practically get all the news that are there on the web? Sort of what kind of things you can do? And um, I want to show you, let's say, three, three things. The first thing I'll show you is how can you identify short textual phrases, basically memes, if you like, that then we will be able to trace how they propagate through the web. And we'll say, OK, can we see how this uh, media ecosystem, how does it work? Sort of that will be the first, let's say, half of the talk. Then, in the, then I'll show two more, uh, um, two more, let's say, more computer science questions. First question will be, um, imagine that, so all that we see is how people mention information, but we don't see who influences whom. Or in a sense of, if you think of how disease propagates, the question is, you see how people get sick, but you don't see who, inf uh, who infected whom. So the question is, can you infer the underlying network over which you know, influence information viruses propagate? And then once you have the network and you know how stuff propagates, then the last question will be, can we go and identify who is really influential in this network? So, or for example, on, in the media case, you could say, which news sites, which should I follow so that I'm most up to date, right? So that I hear about big news before everyone else hears about it, right? So that's basically um, the plan for the talk. And um, this was done um, sort of as uh, when I was still a PhD student at Carnegie Mellon, then part of it at, at Cornell, and uh, the last part, uh, and some part of it now um, at Stanford, um, with a bunch of co-authors. Okay, so um, let's start a bit general, right? So um, <clears throat> what I want to study is basically information and the media, right? And this is some somehow the intersection between news media, technology, and let's say the political process, right? And another thing that, that, um, that uh, why this is interesting is that um, there is basically this tension between, between, let's say, global effects of the mass media, right, that is sort of pushing information on the, you know, between the people. And then, then I have all these uh, local effects um, from the social structure, basically how people talk to one another, right? And um, what I want to ask is basically how, the, how does the information get transmitted uh, between uh, media, Basically, how me between media and these personal networks uh, that arise uh, from, let's say, social contacts, right? So that's the, those, that's basically the dichotomy between uh, mass media, who is sort of pushing things out, and all these like social interpersonal networks that also play a role in how information spreads and transmits. Okay. So, um, and of course, right, with the emergence of internet, blogging, social media, and things like that. Um, this, this difference between global and local influence is somewhat evaporating, right? Because, for example, blogs are now filling the, the, the part between purely personal uh, networks and purely, you know, media type uh, pushing of information, right? Uh, because, you know, I can now follow on Twitter whoever I like. I can read whichever blog I like and things like that, right? And um, another thing that is going on is that this... Um, speed of how media is reporting and you know how we are discussing stories is um, intensified in a sense that um, um, it's not that we are having this you know sort of 24 hour publishing cycle where in the morning you go and buy a new, new newspaper and you go new about new things right it's like you can constantly get a feed of what is going on okay and all these sort of notions get captured into something that, that we intuitively call like a 24-hour news cycle, right? So basically, this is something that is um, 
some, somewhat hard to define, right? But it's, it's a, some kind of natural period or some kind of cycle by which, you know, the news comes, appears, and, and disappears, right? Um, and the, what the, so to show you two examples of how people understand news cycle, here are um, two quotes from the New York Times uh, uh, during the US. 2008 presidential uh, election campaign, right? And you know they discuss McCain and, and Obama, and then they say, you know, how with every news cycle something is different here, and you know, um, you know, they also say how from every news cycle to every other news cycle, the you know the the political text tactics of, of the campaign tends to change. Okay, so um, this is how we intuitively think what a news cycle is. So what I want to ask is basically the following question, right? Is this New cycle, right? Is this something that is a metaphorical construct? Basically, something that you know we humans came up with, and we understand it as a some some kind of it gives us um, an intuitive understanding of how things might might work, or is it actually something that is visible in the data, right? So, is it something that I can quantify and measure, or is it something that it's you know is it a more uh, me uh, metaphor metaphorical con construct? And the other question is then if I can um, if I can measure it. Um, what are its basic properties? Okay, so sort of what are the basic properties of this, this new cycle? And this is this is what I want to do. Okay, so I want to quantify what the new cycle is. Um, then the first question that I need to ask is basically what are the basic units of this new cycle that I would like to track? Okay, so um, here are a few candidates. Sort of this is more for um, computer science people, right? So one way to track you know, news would be to say, okay, I will be tracking how people link to one another, right? So I will be tracking hyperlinks. So, right, if I write a blog post and point to some other blog post, that probably there must have been a reason why I linked to that other blog post, right? So I could say, you know, I could make some inference about that maybe we wrote about related things or that I borrowed some information from that blog post that I'm linking from, right? So one way to do this would be to trace hyperlinks. The problem is, um, this is too fine grained, right? There are very few hyperlinks. Uh, news media don't link among themselves. It's mostly bloggers that link to one another, and most often bloggers don't even create these links, right? So, for example, tracing hyperlinks, this won't work, right? Another thing would be to do um, some kind of topic models, like LDA type topic models. Um, this also won't work because these topics they are too they are too bulky, they are too big, right? It's they are good if you want to model something that changes, you know, over tens of years or something, but not on, on news that sort of changes at a daily or hourly scale. So this is another thing that wouldn't work. Um, here's another idea that you could say. You could say, okay, I will go and I will extract named entities, right? You know, I would go and extract things like Obama, McCain, Microsoft, Apple, Paris, France, and things like that, right? Um, the problem with this is that, you know, Obama appears in news every day, right? Maybe with a bit different intensity, but the particular named entity appears every day. So it would be very hard for me to associate a particular named entity with a particular piece of news, right? So that also wouldn't work so well. And then the next thing that I could do is say, okay, let me extract common sequences of, sequences of words, right? Um, and if I go do that, then these are the common sequences of words that appear on the web, right? Uh, made in China, I love you, web 2.0, and things like that, right? And this is, again, not something that I would associate with the news cycle, okay? So um, th these are sort of four, four failed attempts. So um, what I would like um, is um, to, to, to do the following, right? So basically, I would like to find some textual units that correspond to some kind of aggregates of articles, right? So that they can um, summarize uh, big articles. Um, I want something that, that um, uh, varies in, a, in an order of days, right? Something that is very dynamic in some sense, and the last sort of uh, thing that I would like to do is I would like to be these things to be simple so that I can handle them, you know, on terabytes of data. Okay, so that's sort of my uh, my wish list. And um, the plan now is basically: can I identify such textual phrase, uh, fragments? We can call them phrases or memes that basically travel relatively intact um, through the through many articles, right? That sort of I want to find short textual pieces that that are sort of Characteristic for particular news, and that you know travel intact or they appear pretty much unchanged through a series of articles. And um, the idea is is very simple. Let's use quoted phrases, right? So let's use stuff that appears in a quotation mark, some text, end of quotation mark, right? So basically, this is the regular expression expression to extract my news, right? So I'll be just following quotes, okay? And um, why is this a good idea, right? 
Um, the first thing is that quotes are sort of integral parts of journalistic practice, right? This is the first part. So they appear quite a lot. The second thing is um, they follow um, iterations of the story, right? If there is a particular strong quote somebody made or a statement, then this will appear in many different versions of the article or, or of the same news written by different journalists. This sort of this little signature will appear in all of, all of these different articles, right? And what's another good thing about quotes? I know exactly who said it, when they said it, and where they said it, right? So I can really attribute every little this piece of information to, to a particular point in space to a particular person, right? So I can really identify what, what was it about, okay? So um, that's what I'll be doing, right? So the data that I'll show you here is um, sort of a small data set, right? So I'll be showing you uh, data that we got from Spinner. It's basically just three months of data leading up to the US presidential election. Uh, we have one million uh, news articles, blog posts uh, per day. Um, and uh, basically what we have is everything that Google News has. So that's about 20,000 news sites and um, uh, 1.6 million blogs, okay? So basically what I'm working, on, working with is about um, 100 million documents. Um, that are coming from these, you know, 1.6 uh, million different websites. Okay, and um, and the, the, my my time period is between August 1st and October 31st, right? Um, and when I go and ex do this quote extraction, I get out uh, 112 million different quotes. Okay, out of these uh, 90 million articles. Okay, so now now I have the quotes. Um, and what is, what is the challenge then that I want to solve is the following thing, right? These phrases or these quotes, they, they change a lot. So what I'm showing you here is some kind of um, a, a graph where every node is a, is a quote and the arrows mean how one quote is or how one phrase is included in another, right? So this is how a phrase actually changes coming out of Palin's mouth, right? I mean, this is actually an accurate model. Of <laughs> <laughs> Almost. Okay, so here is what came out of her mouth, right? It's about... Uh, Pelling around with terrorists, right? So here is our oppo opponent is someone who sees America. Uh, it seems as being so imperfect, imperfect enough, enough so that he's spelling around with terrorists who would target their own country, right? So this was the whole, the whole thing, right? And now here you see all different subparts of it and how they uh, relate to one another, right? So here is just pel around with terrorists who would target their own country, Ta terrorists who would target their own country, Pelling around with terrorists who would target their own country, and so on, right? So the first challenge that I have now is that. I get this bunch of these quotes, and I would like to somehow group them together into, into groups that are mutational variants of one another. Yes? Um, it just means, it's a, this means approximate inclusion. So this is sort of included in this, this is included in that, this is included uh, in this, and so on. Okay. okay, so sort of as you go down, things are bigger, right? And here you see, you can see that, you know, here is the second part of the quote, right? About America being imperfect, and here is, you know, sort of the first part of failing around with terrorists, right? And then these things will come together, right? So here is sort of quotes that, that uh, uh, focus on the second part of this big quote, and here are the, here's the sort of things that uh, focus on the first big, first part of the quote, okay? But can I just ask, is, is that flow uh, related to syntax or to time? Did that change over There is time? no time, there's no time here. No so time. here okay. is, so what this is, it just means, um, in some sense, this is short edit distance, okay? So, but I'll go into how I create this graph in the next slide. Okay, so um, here is what I want to do, right? So if I have all this, so imagine that every letter now is a word, right? And these are my phrases, right? So what I would like to do now is um, somehow create an edge where every edge means um, me. So a phrase CF could have evolved from this particular phrase, this particular phrase, or that particular phrase, right? So basically what I want to say is, okay, who, where, where could I, a phrase, um, evolve from, okay? So, um, and what do what does an arrow mean? It just means, okay, I'm approximately included in you, right? I'm sort of your subset, right? So, um, CEF is a, is a subset of BCEF, right? And, you know, another, it's also a subset of uh, CEFP, right? And so on, okay? So, um, I, I create such graph, right? Um, where now these edges are exactly the edges that I had in the previous slide. And what I'd like to do now is um, I will first um, put some weights on these edges that will sort of say, okay, how likely am I, you know, to evolve from this quote versus from that quote versus from that quote. And what I would like to do now is I would like to um, partition 
this graph such that at the end every node has a unique parent right so the, i want to have you know the adam and eve parent here and then you know there must be some kind of line which how i came to be right so what basically i want to do is i want to delete some of these edges here such that the the total volume of the edges that remain in the graph is as high as possible with the constraint that every node has a unique parent, right? If I follow the links, I have to end up with a unique parent, right? So in this case, um, this would be a solution, right? So I would delete here because this 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 one now has two two pot sort of two possible parents, right? This could be a sort of a super a parent, or this could be the the original parent, right? While um, in you know here everything is fine because at the end everything evolved from this person. I don't care whether it evolved this way or that way. At the end, if, if these are the edges I delete, everything is okay. So where did the where did the weights come from? Um, weights. So um, weight. The way I'm do, doing weights is just think of it. You know, it's a string added distance. Okay. You know how similar are we? One is could have I evolved from you, and the other one is how much effort. You know how big change. So how much do I distance? It's not statistical. It's just it's just structural. Uh, exactly. Yeah. Okay. So it's somehow I pre-compute these weights based on the domain knowledge. You know how the language works and things like that. Okay, there was another question. I was good. Why, why are you insisting that we consider only a single source of ancestry? Because if I'm thinking about a whole bunch of news sites, I imagine that sort of many people could arrive at the same short, short quote from having seen different versions of a longer quote. So I would imagine that, yes, it, that, that but people you know, sort of shortened end, it independently. At the end, is something that Sarah Palin said. Right? And then, you know, here can be one part of panning around the terrorists, and here's another part of panning around the terrorists. And when I, you come to this short quote, I sort of don't really care whether you came this way or this way, but this is this particular quote. Okay, that's the motivation why, yes, you need to have a unique, right? There is a unique thing from which you arrive. So this uh, implicitly assumes that the full quote is available somewhere. Uh, sure, yeah. Yes, it assumes that there is, that this is available, yes. Um, Which tends to be the case. Um, yeah, if you get one million news documents a day, then usually the thing is there. But is that a requirement for the algorithm? I mean, can you simplify the graph without having a source of quotes to work from? Or do you you always find A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H within your data set somewhere? So, the re I mean, the reason why we formulated the problem this way is because these quotes are so short that if you do, you really want to keep this lineage information. Otherwise, you can't do anything, right? It, things become very hard, right? Because you can have, for example, imagine Joe the plumber, right? There is, you know, Joe the plumber, most of us will think about a particular context. But actually, if you go into these one million documents, you know, Joe the plumber, the first time you see it, it's way before the real Joe the plumber appeared, right? Just because somebody, you know, really had a plumber whose name was Joe and he came do yeah. something, <laughs> right? And then you are like, okay, what should I do, right? And that's the reason why you want to approach this and say, you know, I just think Joe the plumber is this thing and not, you know, your favorite plumber who came to you or did this something, okay? My last company, we use Twitter data, and we have a huge amount of problems with people having the exact same quote, one carriage return added, or one character added. So actually, it may have just gotten one relevant influential hit, but it was repeated, you know, 100,000 times. That's a, that's a great question. So it turned, like, for us, spam is, like, we don't really handle, like, we didn't even have to handle spam. Um, sort of, the only thing we have is, like, a stop list of around 100 quotes that are movie titles and uh, CD t sort of music titles, right? You know, Indiana Jones, blah, blah, right? So we filter out these things and that's all, right? And sort of what we are left with at the end are these very clean political <coughs> political quotes. So um, the whole, of I mean, of, so in some sense, we didn't really need to go into, into spam too much. So it was not a problem. So we had like few, few, so one thing we said was like, um, you have to appear at, you know, your wall, you, your your total number of mentions has to be, let, let's say, at, at most five times the number of different websites you come from, right? So you sort of have to appear at some particular diversity of websites. This kills the spam already. And then the other thing is we had this uh, short stop list that were basically movie titles because we were not interested in them. So surprisingly, we didn't have any trouble with spam, but it's a good question. Okay. So this would be now my, my, my quote clusters. And let me just show you 
um, an example, right? So this is uh, fundamentals of our economy are strong, right? And these are all, all different ways. Some of them, um, and this is the volume of um, basically how many times this thing was said of fundamentals of our economy are strong, right? And you know some are good and some are you know not that good, but things belong to this particular the fundamentals of our economy are strong, right? And you know here is something bigger where the person cited the it's sort of a quote of a quote, right? But all in all, now what I get is uh, things like that, right? These chunks <coughs> where all these phrases I say, this is all the variant of, you know, fundamentals of our economy or stuff. Okay, so now what I did is now I have a way to take these documents, extract these short phrases, and group them together so that I have all the mutational variants uh, put together. Okay, so um, that's what I have. So what I want to look now is show you some results if I start looking at this data. And the first question is, can you do any, anything interesting with this? Because <coughs> what I'm showing you here is this is time. And this is just, num let's say, um, number of articles per hour I see, or the number of phrases I get uh, per hour, OK? And um, what do I want to make a, a point here is that it's pretty much constant, right? I get this weekly, weekly um, periodicities, right? This is sort of weekend. This is during the week. But overall, there are no trends in this, and no, let's say, particular global trends in the data, right? Sort of the amount of stuff that I see over time is constant, right? So basically, what this is telling me is that somehow the bandwidth of the online media is constant, right? Sort of the bandwidth, how much, how much stuff is produced is about constant over time. Sure, I have this periodicity that, you know, naturally corresponds to the five-day working week and then, you know, two days off and so on. But all in all, there is, you know, it seems to be pretty much constant. Is, is, uh, could it be that the number of blogs and news sources is also constant, or is it could that were new blogs that, that appeared you know, a month into the <coughs> data set, were they excluded? No, we uh, also get new stuff that is coming. And of course, okay. like, the number of blogs is, you know, slowly growing, but the blogs are also dying. So all in all, there's so no, the, yeah, no so you good change. For that. Okay. okay. So basically the question is, are there any interesting temporal variations? And uh, the answer is yes, they are, right? So what I'm showing you here is this is just time from August 1 to end of October. And these are 50 largest volumes, so 50 most mentioned phrases or phrase clusters, right? And, you know, you can nicely see, right? So this was, you know, the, the, Georgia, the aggression, the, the conflict in Georgia between Russia and Georgia, right? Then here is the uh, presidential campaign, you know, we started here with a uh, Republican, uh, um, sorry, with the Democrat convention, and then this was a Republican convention, and then, you know, lipstick on a pig comes, and, you know, here is fundamentals <laughs> of our economy, and again economy, and right here are all sort of attacks on Obama that didn't really work, like, uh, you know, who is this one, this one, can I call you Joe, uh, things like that, right? And this is the last presidential debate, which sort of, you know, the two, one was spreading the wealth around, the other one was, I'm not President Bush, if you remember. And um, then is this one about Sarah Palin, and then it sort of ends, right? But what's interesting now is that even though sort of overall, you know, I see some somewhat constant number of these things coming to me, but I see these huge spikes when I look at the most popular things, right? So um, actually, I have, a, I have a zoom in, right? So here's the most interesting part how things came and how they how they how they went away, right? And the, what is nice about this picture is that this is completely automatically generated, right? I didn't hand, I didn't do anything by hand, right? Like you know, these are exactly the sort of the 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 phrases from from my clusters. Um, you know, it, it's a press of a button and this comes out, right? So it's somewhat interesting that you know you get in what, uh, 90 million documents and at the end you say, look, this is what was going on, okay? Yes. The slight changes in the wording. So, for example, instead of um, "I am not President Bush," if it was "I was not," or oh, um, that goes accounted in the clustering, right? So, the way I create these edges in the clustering, I'm basically having a string string edit distance metric, right? So, you, I say, you know, you can remove a few words, you can swap Got a it. few words, okay. doesn't really matter, right? So, yes, exactly. So here, you know, there will be many different ways of how people said failing around the terrorists or whatever, and you know, this is not like. Here can be those big long quotes, short quotes, doesn't matter, right? As long as sort of they, they are subsets of one another. Okay. And about negations, like if someone said not something versus 
something. Yeah, uh, I'm, uh, that's, I don't account for that. Oh, so okay. I'm sort of, I'm, because I have so much data, I can sort of be Got very it. stupid, if you like. Okay. No, I'm, I'm the same way. <laughs> because I also like, I need, to, um, I need to be able to work with such big amount of data, so I cannot really spend too much time on every individual yeah. thing. Mm -hmm. So um, there are trade-offs, yes. I mean, in print, I could be much smarter how, how, sort of how these things are done, and I think they can be greatly improved in terms of you know, how do we do this clustering and so on. Okay, so that's the first thing. So what I'll show you now is sort of a set of plots where I'm some, somewhat interested in how in the temporal dynamics of, you know, uh, for example, what I'll be showing you is I'll have on the x-axis I'll have time, and on the y-axis I'll have some kind of notion of volume or popularity. And um, zero will always mean this is the peak time, right? This is the time when the, the thing reaches the, the peak attention, right? And what I'm showing you here is this is now um, average uh, uh, popularity over, I think, top 1,000 uh, uh, phrase clusters. And uh, the only thing to notice is, right, long before the thing was said, I see some sort of background noise. And then just around the time when it was said, um, I see almost this, like, delta function behavior, right? So the blue line here is a, is a fit of an exponential function, right? And the only point I want to make here is exponential function doesn't increase fast enough to be able to model the peak. Right, so I have to model this with something that, that goes to infinity at zero, right? So it really like shoots up here, and then you know again it su super quickly decays, and you know then it's the noise. Okay, so this is now on a very long time scale. So what I look now is just this period, okay? And one thing that I will do is um, another is that I will label websites into news media and blogs, right? And I will use a sort of a very simple categorization. I will say. Everything that appears on Google News, I will call news, okay? And everything else, I will call blogs, okay? So I know I have 20,000 news sites here and 1.6 news sites here. But then if I measure, let's say, the number of articles that comes from here versus here, I get 44% of articles coming from these 20,000 sites and, you know, 56 from these 1.6 million sites, right? So at the end, sort of, I have a quite balanced, uh, quite a good balance between news media sites and blog sites, right? And I'm just using Google News classification. So again, I'm just sort of using whatever they, they index that's news, everything else I call blog, okay? And um, what I'm showing you here now is, again, I'm showing you time, now in hours, um, and this is, um, again, a fr fraction of volume or popularity, right? And um, this, this is the popularity of uh, mainstream media, um, um, phrases or when, when sort of the phrase become popular on, in the mainstream media and this is when the phrase become popular on the, on the blogosphere, right? And what this is basically telling me is that um, mainstream, st ma what, so mainstream media tends to, um, tends to be ahead of the blogosphere for about 2.5 hours, right? So the blogosphere tends to follow whatever sort of what the ma mainstream media says with a lag of around 2.5 hours, okay? So that's um, the point here, right? So the difference between these two peaks is uh, 2.5 hours. Okay, so what this would, so what this now tells me is sort of that media is produced, uh, news is produced by media, and then bloggers, you know, feed off, and you know, they they chew for two hours, and then they say something, right? Um, this is the interesting Excuse me. So at negative 12, blogs. Oh yeah, yeah. Decline. Next slide. Good question. Okay, so actually I can go into more details, right? So I can actually take a look at every website and say, okay, when do you mention things, you know, relative to the peak time, right? And here is now, um, so for this experiment, I took top 100 most uh, popular phrases. And what I'm showing you, this is rank, this is the lag. Lag means, negative lag means, yes, you are ahead of the peak popularity. So zero is peak popularity, right? So if, if you are negative, you are before, and if you are positive, you are after. Um, this means how many of these top 100 they reported on, they mentioned, and this is the website, right? So before I was saying um, blocks trail news media for 2.5 hours, but if you look at what is going on here is that the, the, the sites that really are well ahead of, the, of everyone else are basically professional bloggers, right? You know, um, Huffington Post, uh, talking points, memo, hot air, talk lab, daily cost, right? They are, you know, 14, 15 hours ahead of the peak popularity, right? And then, you know, the, the mainstream things come and they're around 10 hours before the, the popularity, right? So what this basically says is, yes, you have these professional bloggers, then you have 
the mainstream media sites, and then you have, you know, millions of these other casual bloggers that, that blog about things, right? So this is what this is saying, yes. Um, there's a distinction at daily cost between the front page bloggers who are part of the editorial staff and the individuals who have their own postings there. Did you make a distinction between those? Um, for this case, I didn't. And the, the thing is, I was considering the first mention on that particular site, right? So I'm only inter I'm interested in when the thing was first mentioned on the site. So probably what is the case here is that all these bloggers that are, you know, that are not on the front page, they sort of do things late, but I don't, I, because something, something else already mentioned is on the daily cost, I just consider that, okay? Okay, and the last of these types of plots is the following, right? So again, time, um, this is peak popularity, and um, what is this? The, the y-axis now is sort of me measuring how much, at every time step, what fraction of, of mentions come from the blogosphere, okay? So if, if it's high here, it means blo mostly blogosphere is mentioning the thing, and if it's sort of low, it means news media are mentioning the thing, okay? And um, this is sort of what you see is this heartbeat-like pattern, right? So before, long before everything happens, it's sort of this background noise at 56%, right? I told you 56% of the stuff comes from blogosphere and 44 from news media in our data set, right? So I'm here, then, then, then um, this, at this time, so bloggers take majority of the mentions, right? So this could be the professional bloggers, right? Then it goes down, this is still before the peak, this is now when me, me, main, mainstream media takes over, right? And then I get another bounce back, which is higher uh, towards the blogosphere, right? And this is, again, right, it's sort of two hours later after the peak, right? And these are, these are now the sort of the normal bloggers, and then it somehow goes back to the, to the normal. But the point is, here it was at 56, here it's sort of at 57, right? So um, blogosphere tends to mention things longer, yes? Uh -huh. um, this is the real data. So this was just some um, um, spline smoothing. Okay, but this is the real data. Fuck, fuck, fuck. Okay. Do you see a lot of variation between, in, in the relationship between mainstream bloggers and, and mainstream news media uh, between quote phrases you looked at? Were there certain types of stories or memes that seem to show a, a more variation from this than others? Um, let I. Um, huh. Let me actually show you, uh, yeah, let me show you my next slide, okay. because it's sort of in this direction, okay? So what I can also do then is to ask sort of this x, y, t queries, which, which what I mean by that is basically I can, I can say, okay, give me, give me news phrases, or give me phrases that have a particular temporal signature, right? So for example, if I have these uh, three numbers, then I can say basically give me something that has um, between x and y fraction of total phrase volume um, occurred on blogs, at least a few days before the overall peak, right? So what I can do now is I can say, okay, I can, um, I can say, give me, give me phrases that appeared on the blogosphere long, be long before they appeared in the news media, right? And um, we, we, we did a very simple experiment where we, where we set this um, to be between 30 and 70, and this was seven days, and um, here are, here are uh, the news, sort of the phrases that, that, that this simple query took out, right? And um, this is the Sarah Palin and the global warming thing that sort of bloggers discovered and then later the mainstream media reported about. Um, and um, this one was another um, phrase about, uh, you know, uh, the, the thing is above um, someone's pay grade, right? This is also from the political campaign. So using such a simple, um, simple query, it turns out that around, let's say, three, three to four percent of all these popular phrases started in the blogosphere and went into the mainstream media, right? So if you look at how much evidence is there that, you know, bloggers come up with something that then becomes very popular on the in the mainstream media, um, there's around 4% of such things, okay? So that's sort of the last, the last thing I can say about this. And what I haven't showed you, we have a simple model of how, that models these temporal dynamics of these phrases. Um, where we have like three different um, three different ingredients that you can ask. So maybe you can ask, okay, what would be the three basic ingredients that every phrase would have that would depend how popular it is, right? And there are sort of 
the, the three things is one is what we call attractiveness, right? How interesting is this particular piece of news, right? The other one is uh, how old it is, right? Sort of the older you are, the less likely are people to talk about you. And the third ingredient is popularity, right? The more people talk about you, the more likely, more, more likely other people are to talk about you, right? And then actually it turns out that we can quite reliably uh, model these temporal signatures without really needing the attractiveness um, ingredient, right? So we sort of need popularity and age, but attractiveness doesn't seem to play much role in sort of a very simple model that we were playing with, okay? So um, this now concludes um, what I wanted to say about the new cycle and how to track it. So now I sort of want to show two more computer science -y things, if that is fine. Yeah, Okay. Maybe 10 more minutes and then we'll okay, sure. open it up and give you even more questions than we've been okay. giving you. So this, I may rush a bit, but uh, try to bear with you. Okay, so here is what, what, so if you go back and say, okay, what are we really doing, right? Here is, you know, my, my world, my set of blogs, and all I see is how these blogs mention things, right? I see that, you know, a particular blog mentioned, mentioned the phrase and then somebody else mentioned it and somebody else mentioned it and, you know, there's a new phrase that then some other people were mentioning over time, right? But what I don't see is, how, how this phrase really propagated, right? So I don't see these links that I would say, okay, it started here, it went, you know, to this blog, then, uh, blog, then it went here, and then it went here, and that way, right? So I don't see the links. I only see when people mention the things, right? So what I'll be asking now is the following, right? So I will try to infer these diffusion or influence networks, right? So I will assume that, you know, there are some nodes in my network, and there are some edges in this network. But all I see are the nodes, and I don't see the edges. But what I see is then the times when nodes get infected. So what I mean by that is, you know, imagine that A says, uh, uh, posts a particular piece of news, and then, you know, a bit later, C, C talks about it, and B talks about it, and E talks about it, right? And all I see, I say, okay, there was, I call this now a cascade, and I see that A, node A said this at time one, C said it at time two, B said it at time three, and E said it at time four, right? And now I can see a different cascade, you know, that starts at C and somehow spreads through my network, right? And again, all I see is the temporal signature of how this cascade spread through the network, right? So what I would like to do now is to say, okay, can I infer sort of from such data, can I infer the edges of this network, okay? So what I would basically like to do is, if you think of a disease, is I see times when people get sick, but I don't see who really, who, who you know, coughed at whom or who infected whom, and I would like to infer who, what were the edges over which the infection propagated, okay? So now I'll give very quickly how you can formulate this problem and how you can solve it, okay? So I'm given a cascade. A cascade for me um, is just, you know, this is a cascade, right? It tells me who got infected and when they got infected, okay? But I don't know how, okay? So then I can say, okay, if I take two nodes in, the net, in my network, how likely is that um, I infected J? And I'll make a very simple model here. I'll just say, you know, the probability of infection depends on the time, how, how, what was the time difference between the, the times when the two nodes got infected. Like the longer the time, the less likely you are to infect the person, okay? So I'm making, I can make this arbitrarily complicated. So it doesn't really matter. This is sort of the simple thing I can do, okay? But you know, here I could have a very, very complicated model of how likely is one person to infect another person based on time, characteristics, things like that. Okay, but for now, let's just assume it's something very simple. Okay, so imagine that I can compute this thing. What I want to now compute is how likely is this cascade to happen if it propagates in a particular pattern T. So what I mean by that is if this is my, um, my network and you know this cascade really propagated from A to C and then from A to B and from B to E and not maybe you know this way or something or or this way, um, then it's easy for me to compute how likely is this cascade to occur, right? I just say, how likely is this cascade to occur in such a tree pattern? I just go over the edges of this tree and compute the probabilities that, you know, A infected C, A infected B, and B infected E, okay? E, of course, conditions that I know how, how the infections, which edges were sort of uh, guilty for these infections, right? But because I don't know these edges, I need to consider basically all possible trees or all possible patterns how these four nodes could get infected, okay? So what in principle I would like to compute, I would say, okay, 
how likely is that the scapes to occur in my graph? Um, I need to go now over all possible propagation trees G and compute the probability of a cascade under that tree times the probability of that tree. Okay, and you know, I just I'll assume that all trees are equally likely, so I can ignore that. But see, the problem is that I have to go over all possible propagation trees. Okay, so even now, if I can compute how likely is a particular cascade to occur in a, in a graph, then I can define the following problem. I say, okay, I want to select a graph on K edges such that all my the set of my cascades is the most likely to happen, right? I want to say, okay, this is a set of cascades I observed. What is the most likely graph over which, over which cascades could have propagated? And this graph has to have at least K edges. Um, the, sorry, at most k edges. Why do I have this constraint? Is because if I have a complete graph, that's always the best explanation, right? If anyone can infect anyone else, then you just order the, the nodes in the time of how they got infected, and that's the best way, right? That's sort of the easiest way for you to do it. So, but if you want a graph that is not, you know, a complete graph, then you need to have some constraint here. So it's sort of for technical reasons, right? And there are two problems here. First is that computing this thing, right, is intractable, right? The reason is because you have to consider all possible um, propagation trees. It turns out that there is this beautiful matrix, matrix tree theorem that will do this super exponential thi thing in cubic time. Okay, so that's the nice thing here. And the other thing is, even if you're able to compute this, the question is, how do you maximize over it? Okay, and there is another magic that happens that you can prove that um, this function is submodular which basically means it has this diminishing returns property, which in turn means that I can find this graph that is near optimal, okay? And I'm sorry that I left lots of details, but sort of here are two magical moments that you feel very happy about when they happen and everything works. And um, here's a small example, okay? So I'll show you now a small example. So the setting is the following. There is a true network um, with some edges, right? And it says, this node can infect that node, okay? And now I will um, use, let's say, some independent uh, cascade model or something to, to, to simulate a few cascades over this graph, right? And then I want to go and, in, and sort of reconstruct the graph from the times when nodes got infected. And the simple baseline that I will compare against here is, that, is just that for every edge, I will compute the strength of that edge. Basically, I'll say, okay, over all the cascades, what was the probability that you infected the um, and this will be the weight of that UV edge, okay? And if I go do that, this is what I get, right? So these are the edges that I correctly infer, and then the red are the ones that I miss. And for example, you can, if you focus here, right, what happens? So when a cascade starts somewhere here, it comes to this node, and then lots of these other nodes get infected over time, right? But then what is this, um, what this is uh, confusing is that if this gets infected at time two and this one gets infected at time three and this got infected at time one, then uh, the edge here gets created, right? So you get these types of edges because it's more, more likely that, that uh, this happened than, than this because the time delta here is longer than time delta there. But if you use our thing, you basically do almost perfectly, okay? So this is how well we can do um, using all those tricks that I showed you before, so okay? With the comment that a lot of the graph theory here is, like President Obama's quote, well above our pay grade, what does this mean for actually modeling real world? Great. Okay. So what I have here now is a very small part of a network where I basically see when media says particular things. I also see times, and now I'm trying to say, okay, if if you know the thing is spreading, or if one media is following another media. Um, how are they following one another, right? And uh, this is a very small part. I sort of labeled here blue are blogs and red are mainstream media. And yes, Huffington Post and Salon.com are mainstream media because they are indexed by Google News, okay? But you can see sort of nice things, right? So here is a big political cluster and you know, you that are more expert on these things that I am would probably find more interesting patterns here. But that's sort of the politics. Um, this is gossip. And, um, and this is uh, technology, right? It's like this model and gadget, uh, CNET, and things like that, right? So you nicely get these topical clusters based on who, who, who is following whom. And you also find these sites here, you know, that they talk about uh, 
everything a bit. Right, that they sort of act as bridges between these different areas. Okay, so that's the first thing I want to show. And the second thing I want to show is the following thing. Um, if again, this is my blogosphere, and now that I have the network, I can say, you know, uh, information appeared here, then it's propagated this way, this way, and that way, okay? And then, you know, there's another piece of information that's propagated in a particular way, and here's the third piece of information that's propagated in a particular way. So now I can ask, um, which things do I want to read to be most up to date, okay? And here's one way, right? So one way would be, okay, I want to read this blog, okay? So what's good about this? The good thing is that I get to know about all three different things that happened, right? I get to know about red, blue, and yellow, okay? What is bad is that I get to hear them very late, right? They started, you know, long time before I get to see them, um, on, right? So I sort of know everything, but very late. Or I could say, let me read this guy, right? So what's good about this one is that, yes, I get to hear things exactly when they appear, but, you know, I don't get to hear about the red thing. Okay, um, so I get, to I get to know about the blue, I get to know about the yellow, but I don't get to know about the red, right? So now what I can ask is the question, um, if I have a blogosphere and I want to, let's say, follow three blogs, which three blogs should I follow such that I somehow cover this blogosphere as, we as best as I can? In a sense that, you know, I want to select follow this blog because it covers the topics that appear in this part of the blogosphere, right? And, you know, then I can say I want to follow this one and so on and so forth, right? And again, um, this is hard to do, but you can do it. Um, and um, so the way the algorithm works is the following. So here's another real example. So every dot here is a blog. Um, and the way the algorithm works is that um, we will see sort of some colors appear. And what I'll be doing is I'll be showing you what happens as you are reading more blogs, right? So the first thing that sort of the algorithm says, it says, read this blog here, right? And what it says now is you will sort of detect everything, but when information sta uh, starts here, it takes quite a long time to come there, right? So the second thing you will select is, for example, you say, okay, this is the second blog to read, right? Because this is covering this part of the blogosphere. And you know, this is the third blog, and fourth, and fifth, and so on, right? And now, um, every color sort of tells me which is the block that is covering this particular, you know, this particular block here, okay? And, you know, I can do this, and um, I can quickly show you how well it works. So this is, for example, the number of blocks that I'm reading, and this is the fraction of stories that I'm detecting. So higher is better. Um, right, if I would be reading random blogs, this is what I would do. If I would be reading blogs that have lots of posts, so I just take, I will take the, the 100, mo 100 blogs with the most volume, okay? Um, I could also say I will read blogs based on the number of outlinks, right? The more, the more outlinks you have, the more likely I am to read you, right? Another thing is to say, okay, I will read blogs that receive the most inlinks, right? That w works better. But if you actually do the thing, right, this is how much we can do um, or how good is our solution in terms of what do you need to read and how much stories you cover, okay? And you know, this is uh, who is the most influential back in 2006, it doesn't matter. Um, so let me, the last slide basically. Uh, what I want to, basically what I showed you is, you know, some kind of framework or idea how to track, the, how to track memes and news uh, as, they, as they, you know, propagate over the web, how you can quantify what's going on and what kind of sort of nice algorithmic consequences it gives. We have this website called memetracker.com where um, there is some demos, there is all the data that I showed, so you can go download the data and play with it, this uh, meme tracker data and so on. And um, there are many further questions, right? So one very important question is, what are we missing, right? We are extracting these quotes, it gives us something, but we are missing lots of other things. So what kind of biases are we introducing and what are we missing? That's sort of the first thing. Um, the second thing is, um, you know, how can this help me to, for example, identify dynamics of polarization, right? Are there sort of political camps or, you know, if there's a particular quote, does it sort of get split up and, you know, one part of the network likes the first part and the other part of the network li likes the second part. Um, and uh, one thing that we sort of, with this network, uh, network, diffusion network internet we try to address is, you know, how are these memes actually spreading between the people? Yes, okay, so. Uh, 
I'm done. Thank you. I am somehow guessing there are more questions in this room. So uh, who wants to jump in yeah, first? Go ahead. What would happen if you uh, didn't restrict yourself to quotes? Because you, I mean, the memes could be found in, so you could use the sentence as the, as the baseline and, and run the same algorithm. It would take a lot longer because you have a lot more data. Um, but, but you would you would end up with clusters of sentences where you know this sentence is talking about the troubled asset relief program, for example. Like this is because it's using a lot of the same words. Um, I just, I mean, clearly it's a different, it's a different dynamic because, because with the quotes you're dealing with people who are essentially referring to the same event mm -hmm. uh, where something fixed was said. But it seems like, the, I just wonder how general this would be, the, the clustering approach that you use as a, as a topic modeling kind of approach when you apply not just to fixed quotes, but just, just like... Uh -huh, you're just throwing text. a bunch of sentence segments, whatever. Yeah. I mean, in principle, yes, you could do that, right? That would... Um, the question is, would you, you know, how would you get retired before the computation would be done? But right. uh, everything else, yeah, in, se in a sense, you, yes, you could do it. I think, like, what we noticed is that things, so these things <coughs> work really well if you work with about half a year of data. When you try to do this on the full year of data, um, there was just sort of too much of this background noise and things started to break, to break down, the clustering itself. So this very simple version. So I think you really need to worry about then a time in a sense that you know you have to spike or your temporal signature <laughs> needs to be about similar or you have to appear at about the same time as your parents or something, right? Um, and the other thing is you'd want to be much smarter about how you define connections in this graph. But in, a, in, a, in principle, yes, you can, you, can, you can do this over anything. So one thing that we are trying to do now is we, we are trying to do it over tweets, right? Because tweets are these 140 character long things so just treat each one of them as a sentence and see if there's any, you know, copying or mutation between these two. So yeah, you could, you could easily do that. Any other question? Yep. I was wondering if you ever kind of came, maybe I missed it, if you ever came to a final <laughs> definition of the phrase news cycle. That's one of the things you started out talking about. Uh, you know, and I'm interested in this because I, I worked for 10 years for the Associated Press uh -huh. in the pre-internet era when the news cycle was something very real and concrete, and, and we, we, we toiled under it all the time. Uh huh. <laughs> had a very specific meaning. <laughs> um, so, I think through this, through this. So, one thing that I haven't showed you is you can then take these temporal signatures of the phrases, and like you can say, okay, what are the typical classes of these signatures, right? And you it turns out that there are six of them, right? You sort of have you have. Um, one that you have, there are sort of three that tell you how wide, how, how quickly it rises and how quickly it decays. One is sort of very narrow, one is symmetric but very wide, and one is sort of very quick and slower. Mm -hmm. And then you have one that, uh, you know, there's a small spike on the first day and a big spike on the second day. The next one is sort of, this is flipped. And the last one is a spike and then a very, very slow decay, like three, four days. And then what we also did is, then you can say, okay, we, we labeled websites into like seven different categories. Like you, we said, okay, professional blogs, normal blogs, news agencies, televisions, newspapers. I think that was it. And then like you find very nice characteristics of, you know, if a news agency pushes something out, then it's very, very thick. And then um, sometimes sort of then you have two behaviors. One is very slow decay and one is very quick decay and things like that. So you can find these nice correlations between how things will spike given who, who, who mentioned them and when. Um, so this was, this was one thing that we were looking at. Uh, and yeah, you see this very, sort of very strong 24 hour signatures. Um, another thing that I should say, and I haven't really uh, talked about it is, um, together with the, um, uh, the Pew Center for uh, Excellence in Journalism, right? What we did with them was we were working on um, coverage of the this economic crisis right the great depression and they were and it was very interesting when we were working together to they were really interested in you know who were who, whose phrases or whose quotes got mentioned about with regard to this particular topic right and then you can compare you know was it sort of president obama who was um pushing out or who got cited the most with regard to this topic or you know was it was it some economists and so on and um that we got some very interesting results there where sort of you know, domain experts got very interested in the methodology itself and they found it quite useful, which I think was very nice result. Yes. 
This is, I'm fascinated about how this shows the spread of information in terms of where you can go get it. And, and I don't understand your work to have, uh, be so inclusive as to understand when people actually engage with it. But do you know of anyone who's working on that, that there, that there may be a, a, a news cycle by class of human being who consumes news that is not all people who are sitting in front of desks all day with always on uh, internet things that have, that have a natural news cycle to their own lives. Do you know of any work that goes there? I, um, I mean, I think what you are asking is a very good point, right? Because we, we just see everyone who's connected, right? We don't yeah. see people who are not connected or who are, you know, not blogging in some sense. So, right. um, I, what should I say? So I think that's sort of a very, a very valid point. Yeah, that we are biased yeah. towards. No, no, no criticism intent. I'm just wondering if there's yeah. other work. I, I, I think there's, there's some good work out there that's looking at this more from ethnography, right? Yeah. I mean, because this is really an analysis of yes. when the publication takes place. Right. I would point you towards something like AP study. <laughs> Uh, where they looked at young news consumers and did a, a sort of detailed yes. ethnographic yes. approach. And what they were able to do was sort of come out with the idea that people are actually looking for information continually through the day. There's sort of a, a morning feeding, whether that's TV yes. news or a newspaper, but then there's sort of people going and reloading throughout the day. One thing that actually would be really interesting is to try to graph uh, essentially news reporting or publication frequency, which is essentially what yours data is giving you, versus news consumption sort of intuited from these eth ethnographies and try to get a sense for whether the two actually parallel that, That's That's what I'm another. curious, very or, curious or, about. Or actually just something which is probably a little more simpler, which is trying to add to the data um, traffic or audience data from the sources that you're actually analyzing. Exactly. So, right. for example, if you have click-through data yeah. from the media sites, then you can yeah. just say, what's the number of clicks on that, on that mm -hmm. article? So, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Unfortunately, Unfortunately as we know, is, from it, it's yeah, the holy grail for most of these yeah. Impossible to get. But yeah, that would be a very nice way to say, okay, you know, okay, it got mentioned, but how did it get popular or something? Mm -hmm. Got a question over here. So how unusual is the period that you're studying in terms of the dominance of quotes, right? So election periods, they're all about quotes. People making speeches when they wouldn't normally be making speeches. You know, news is based around the quote because it's based around policy uh, statements of policy positions and that sort of I'm just wondering sort of what the external validity of this, this is. So outside of that, those types of special periods. I see. I, that's, that's an excellent question. So um, we, we looked at also some other time periods that were sort of three months, you know, left and right. And we still found um, there were still spikes. They were a bit lower and they were much more diverse in a sense that, you know, the iPhone release you know, the gets quoted, gets quoted a lot, or we were, you know, looking afterwards, it was like the Obama inauguration speech and so on. So there are these examples where sort of also later that, that happened. So yes, I agree that this pre-election period is a bit, is a bit specific, but even later, it's not that it would be flat. You find these nice things that, that uh, take over. Maybe not in such a, such a proportion as lipstick on a pig did, right? Mm -hmm. But there are, yes, please. Um, so along with the with the popularity of memes, have you have you been looking at the sentiment of them? So for example, if people discuss them with a positive tone or a negative tone? Um, I haven't, but I think that would be a great idea. Like to say, okay, now here's the here's the meme, you know, what's the sentiment around it? Yeah, I think that would that would be great. I think you have the data do. and I would love to see that. I can yeah, yeah. Great. We can do that. Yes. I was just curious, you had the graph that showed sort of the number of blogs and the different methodologies uh -huh. of coverage. Have you looked at how an aggregator like, say, Google News fits in terms of coverage? So what I can do is this, right? I know sort of, I know what, what uh, this is what Technorati is doing, mm -hmm. right? And, you know, it's number of findings, right? Uh, but still, it does much worse. And the reason why it does much worse is because when, when I optimize, I also consider overlaps, right? If there are two very popular blogs that cover the right, same topics, one. I will just pick yeah. one, right? So that's sort of this, this, the, the, the difference here. Well, Google does that in some senses. Google does the cluster. It says there's yeah. 576 others with the story. So I just didn't know how good their coverage would be. And I, I assume they're using a purely, you know, algorithmic um, 
yeah, system they are, of they grabbing are using, their... they're using uh, they're using some very clever uh, clustering approach um, the question there is I think it's a good question like what what you're asking is a good question I don't have a too good answer mm -hmm. because it's also not clear how would you measure what you know what what I'm just on the it'd wire. probably just be you know Google and a data point I'm just sort of curious where they'd end up on that um, part, part of what's tricky about this is what's going on in Google News. There's a really nice algorithm there, which is collapsing thousands of stories down to story. Mm -hmm. Which is really somewhat similar. Open question about how you do that. And this is one approach to this doing it. This is one approach, and whatever their We're black box is. We're trying a really sloppy approach to it with mm -hmm. Media Cloud. There's a bunch of different approaches to it, but you know, figuring out how you do that collapse. In fact tells you, first of all, how you score mm -hmm. something like this. And uh, it's hard because, to a certain extent, we're competing against a black box. Yeah, no, I wasn't, I mean, just sort of looking for a data point, not, you know, yeah. a, a horizontal vertical comparison. I would think that Google News would be very close to here, right? Mm -hmm. Because what it gives you at the end is sort of, you know, links to New York Times, Bloomberg, Wall Street Journal, and so on. So it's, and yes, it sort of does things based on the based on the stories, but it does it on on the individual stories, not on sort of the clouds of stories. Mm -hmm. right? Which what you'd like to do is not just say I want to know about a particular story, but about all these different stories that are there. Right. So I think it would be here, right? Because what are the things that that, that, that get most linked are these mainstream media sites. Yes. Um, so on this board here, um, how 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 resilient is this like? As as uh, when you're trying to select the most influential blog, how resilient is this? As uh, things change over time, like because it's a particular snapshot perfect, of time, right? Perfect. So yeah, 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 yeah. Is, is this any good at will be the same ten blogs six months from now or someone else? Because it's an, this is to the, talking about the iPhone. This is an excellent question. So basically, the question is right. I use some historic data to decide which blogs to read, but then there are all these news that happen tomorrow, and I'm really interested in those, not you know the old ones. And the question is, how do I generalize the future? Um, so um, we have we have ways how to do that. So if you do it naively, then it's problematic. The other thing is also what's problematic is what do you say here? Do you say the number of blogs I read or the number of posts I need to read? Right. So for example, if you say the number of blogs, then you are biased towards blogs that have lots of posts. Right. If you say I want to read the smaller number of posts. Then what will happen is you will be selecting, you will be like heavily overfitting in a sense that you'll be selecting all these small blogs with you know three posts that just by chance were early in one year, right? So it turns out that um, you can very nicely interpolate between sort of two, these two extremes, and if you find um, and that gives you so if you do that, that gives you good generalization. Another sort of heuristic that gives you good generalization is uh, just exclude small blogs, right? You say I want to read something that you know at least has some daily daily volume and that and then um, you generalize quite well but we went into quite a lot of detail about this generalization and actually there's another formulation of this problem that gives you more robust solution that i didn't mention so yeah um we can do we can do it but if you are not careful you have the over any other yeah Catherine? um i think this is a dumb question i probably missed it but what is our solution uh -huh. Our solution is this. So if I only have three blogs to read and I want to know as much as possible? So this is the, the idea is that you are sort of selecting these blogs greedily and say, okay, this is what this blog covers. And then you are asking, okay, which new blog should I add to cover the most new area, right? Or here's the idea, right? I would. I so would, what blogs specifically are those or what news sites? What well, your data say? set? Uh-huh, what's my data set? Well, should so, I be reading Talking Points, Memo, New York Times, and Huffington Post? If I want, if I have three blogs I can read and I want the most information then this about would be the, the 2008 election? So for the 2006, uh, where's my list? This would be the, right, so if you want three, pick these three. This was at least the, you know, the data set from 2006. And if you want six, pick the top six, right? Because the way the algorithm works, it sort of picks, first picks the blog that covers the most. And then it picks the next block that covers the most new area subject to whatever you have already covered, right? So it sort of always picks something that covers the most new stuff. So we can, if you say I want to pick top, it's sort of the best something, you just pick the top here. And it takes into account when they post it as well? Exactly, yeah. So so what I'm actually, inter like there are again, three different formulations of how do you think about what do you really want? Like, so one thing is to say, I want to minimize the time between when the, when the stuff was mentioned and when I get to hear about it, right? That's one, one ob objective. The other objective is to say, I don't really care when I 
when I detect it. I just want to know that it happened. And then the last objective is to say, I don't care how late I detect, but what I care is that af after myself, lots of people get infected, right? And um, the one that we were experimenting with the most is I, when I detect, I want sort of I want to have a lot of mentions afterwards. So that's that's the one that makes. So that how makes is sense. this different from the 2008? The election? Uh, we haven't run this on the okay. 2008 data. Um, one thing that I should say is this is, so the way we started looking at this problem is the following application. You have, it's completely different. You have a city water distribution network, right? So like pipes and houses, right? And you have people drinking water. And then you, you, assu you assume that, you know, at some of these junctions, a contamination can happen and the poisonous water is spreading through your network. So the question is, where should you put sensors, like monitoring stations, to detect these contaminations, OK? And what I'm doing here is the same thing. I say, here's my blog network, and I have these information contaminations. Where should I place my sensors to detect these contaminations, right? And now I can say, I want to detect, so sort of the penalty or the reward I get depends on the time, how long it was between the introduction of contamination and I detected, or how many people I saved, right? If uh, this would basically say, after I detect how many pe how many other people would get infected. So the more people I save, the more people sort of would get infected afterwards, the better. So it turns out it's the same problem. Um, but uh, so this is this is how we came to look at this. Yes. Hi. Um, have you tracked the which variant of the mean becomes popular? So if you have say some sort of quote, um, I'm guessing that it doesn't spread in the same proportion as it initially appears. And so have you checked to see? what variant is the one that becomes the most popular? I think that's, um, so we looked at this a bit, but not enough. And I think that's another very interesting thing that one could do, is actually try to somehow understand what are, you know, what are the catchy parts. So I have a bunch of future work things here. And one thing is, so here's a graph, right? This is lipstick on a pig, but it's still a pig. And each line here, so the, the width of the line tells you the number of mentions of the thing and uh, where it appears. So this means the most popular part of this quote was, you know, lipstick on a pig, right? And this was then the second most popular one and third most popular one and so on, right? So this sort of gives you some idea of which subparts get mentioned more than others. But I think it would be very interesting to try to model and understand such things. And we haven't done much with this. So I think that's another interesting idea. Uh, okay, let's go this way, so yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, just a technical question. If there is no quotation, is that your method is still spent? No quotation. News, for example, in Chinese newspapers, maybe a lot of news and no quotation. If they just mention someone mentioned something, something, no quotation marks. Um, so yeah. the way I'm doing possible to yeah. use to that kind of context. Um, so the way we do it right now is we only take quotations. So we are sort of super dumb. Um, of course, you could start with a small seed set and then expand and search for you know similar things outside quotation marks and so on. So there are ways how you could go around it. But what I showed you really just takes, starts with things that, are, that appear in quotes. And given that we have such a high volume of, of, uh, of news, we can afford to do that. So that's what I would say. Uh, so there was a question here and then, yeah. uh, okay. So, so you, uh, you've inferred this, <coughs> this distribution tree, mm -hmm. which, <coughs> the infection tree, whatever you want to sure. <coughs> call it, by this nice optimization stuff and all the math worked out beautifully okay. for you. And, and, and so you've been able to find these uh, sites that are, that are good uh -huh. sources. You don't have any empirical data to, uh, by which you can judge whether that is in fact, these are in fact the paths by which the stuff follow, flowed from one, one news source to another, do you? Uh, that's a great question. So one thing that we did was the following. Um, I know the hyperlinks, right? So I know when a yeah. particular blog linked to another yeah. particular blog. So what I did is was the following. I also see what this, what phrases this box mentioned. So the experiment we did was that we throw away hyperlinks. We only see what people mention. And then we say, can we infer who linked at whom? And we can do that quite well. So that was one way to, to, yeah, that's a validation. Yeah. The, to the validation on the real data. Because usually, so another thing would be, um, when you do that on Twitter, right? On Twitter, you know, because you know who follows whom, you know what are the links over which information can propagate, right? So the question again would be, if you see what people talk about, can you infer the Twitter social network? So that would be another way to validate. Um, what we also did is, we did lots of experiments on synthetic data. And there, 
regardless of the network, like our break-even point is in 90s. So it's like, it works amazingly well. Um, of course, I mean, on synthetic data, you know, there is sort of, there is variance, but you know, the stuff, the thing follows your model, so everything is good. But when we tried also on this um, real data with these hyperlinks sort of um, comparison, it did quite well. We have time for one last question. Okay, so go ahead. ahead. Okay, yep, I'll do my best. Um, so, I mean, I guess bouncing off of your comment, I, I guess it's impossible to find the, the real uh, empirical uh, or, or objective links between pages. So you're using maximum likelihood to find like the hidden Markov model, as it were, the behind like the the uh, the abstract connections between uh -huh. these pages. Uh, you're using like probabilistic links. Sure. Yes. What's the, what's the most likely path between these? Yeah, yeah, I mean, there is, I, like, I think, um, yes, there is sort of no ground truth, and it's also, it's also, the question is, what's the interpretation of this network, right? In a sense that all I'm saying is, my links mean this particular site tends to repeat after that particular but, site. But that's, as you've shown, it does very well. It, that's, yeah, exactly, but you know, what are, are sort of, there's no ground truth or no objective truth. So yeah, I agree with that. So things that where you could get such ground truth would be, for example, Twitter. And, but even there, what, for example, people found in these networks is that information tends to jump a lot, right? It's not that, you know, things would start somewhere and then nicely spread. No, it's just sort of pops up at different places because there is everything else around the world that, you know, also plays as a the role of sort of does diffusion on its own, right? And then you just see it pop up. Um, so that's another thing. So, well, Yuri, thank you very, very much, and thanks for taking all these questions. Yeah.